Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. If you don't know where Genesis is, it's the very first book of the Bible. When I was a kid, um, some things happened that I didn't handle very well. And I chose to hide from, the, from those things, like many of us do. Some of us choose alcohol, some of us choose drugs. I guess we all choose different things when we just don't really want to deal with things. And uh, what I chose was pornography. And I got into it when I was nine years old, um, which Side note, it's never too early to establish some kind of restrictions for internet use in your house. Never too early. Because, I mean, I got into it when I was nine, and we didn't even have internet in the house. Even if we had had internet, it was, you know, you remember how internet used to be? Dial-up? Well, if you want to cure a pornography addiction, get dial-up. <laughs> Tell you what. Anyways, um, but the thing is, at first, you know, it was something new and everything, but real quickly, that changed. I wasn't having fun. And uh, there comes a point in any kind of an addictive behavior where you're repeating the pattern, but it's not actually providing um, the relief or the comfort that it initially did. It's with every addiction. You know, at first, you know, here's like, let's say, this is rock bottom, right? And then you're, you're struggling with something, and, and it gives you relief. But then over time, the addiction takes you below the line, where on a good day, you still feel worse than you used to. So you repeat the addictive behavior to try and make you feel better about it. But all that that does is take you further into feeling worse. And so you repeat it to feel better, but even on the high points of the addictive behavior, you still feel worse than you did on the low points before. Does that make sense? It's the same with all addictive behaviors. It's you repeat an action and you, you oftentimes you're unable to stop the action, but yet you feel a need, like a, like a tie to the action. Now, I, I know some people might say, well, I don't really have a problem with pornography. Well, I understand that, but I mean, everybody has a problem with some kind of addictive behavior. I mean, you might not be given to it, but you will still struggle with it. Um, but when I was in pornography, you know, I, I wasn't having fun. I did it as kind of an escape from the situation around me, but that was only worked for a few years. By the time I was about 11, I, I, I wanted out, but really there was no way that I could see out. And so I'd repeat the stupid pattern, and I'm sure if you've ever been in addictive behavior, you know exactly what, how it goes. You do it, and then you say, you know, God, I'm sorry that I did it, and you beat yourself up for it, and then you do it again, so you you feel all bad about it again, you beat yourself up over it, and you keep doing the same thing over and over again. And you keep intending to change, but then you never actually change. Anybody who's been through addiction, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so you repeat the this, this cycle of, of, you know, intending and not really able to fulfill that intention. And when you're going through something like that, you kind of feel like a lost cause. You, you, or at least I did. Have you ever felt like a lost cause before? Have you ever felt like, God, just give up on me? <laughs> you're never gonna, you're never gonna get me there. And kind of like, you believe that God is done with you. Luckily, God is not like a teenager. <laughs> he doesn't just quit. God doesn't just quit. God is one of those gods <laughs> that just won't let you drop. You know what I mean? You know how they say he's just one of those guys? We all feel like we have missed the train at one point in our life. And that's exactly what we're going to look at tonight. Genesis chapter 17 verse 8 says this. I will give to you and to your descendants after you, God is talking to a man named Abraham, okay, the land of your, your sojournings, 
all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So, once again, I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, the place, the place where, you're, where you're traveling around, um, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Um, if you're not very familiar with, um, with geography, um, this is modern-day Israel and Syria and a little bit into Jordan. Um, Jordan wasn't really technically part of Canaan, but it was included later. It's a whole thing. I'll save you the boring details. M moral of the story being, um, if you watch the news, it's referred to as Palestine, um, southern Syria, that kind of region in there. Um, and God is making a promise to a man named Abraham, who was the forefather of Israel, the, the nation of Israel. And God is promising that he's going to you know, get, bless Abraham's descendants and give them this. Okay, so this sounds like a good, a good thing, okay? God had a plan. Let me turn right here. Uh, don't re we're not turning to Judges 10 just yet. But God had a plan and Israel had a purpose. Those seem like good days. You know, you know where you're going. You, you know what the future holds. This is this is a good thing. God has a plan, and Israel has a purpose. It's like the newlywed phase. For those of you who has, who have gotten married, you know, you marry someone, and you're like, man, nothing nothing this person can do can can make you mad. I mean, you will love them for forever, and things will just always be rosy. And then there's that point. There's that day, and every married person knows that day when you wake up and you look at them and you just think. Oh, I want to punch you in the face so hard. Why don't you ever just put the toilet seat down? Why won't you ever just pick up your socks? And every married person has that day where they realize the honeymoon is over. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who have never been married, you'll know. You'll know. It'll creep up on you like a thief in the night. <laughs> but anyways... Um, so this is kind of like the honeymoon phase with God and Israel. You know, everything, I mean, not, nothing could go wrong. We, we have, we have, God has a plan for us. Man, oh man, how great is that? And, uh, you know, they, they were doing good. Abraham and his descendants, they were doing pretty good. They're going in a good direction. They, you know, they, they had a future and they had a hope. And, uh, boy, I tell you, that's just, that's just worth everything in the world. So now, now turn to Judges chapter uh, 10. I know it's, oh no, it does say 10 there, okay, good. Um, Judges chapter 10. So at this point, a lot of things have happened. And I, I do mean a lot of things. Um, Abraham's kids have turned into a whole nation. Um, and they have been enslaved. They've been freed from slavery. They walked around the desert. Uh, they went to the land. And here we get in chapter Genesis. I mean, sorry, Judges chapter ten, uh, starting in verse seven. It says, "The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the sons of Ammon. They afflicted and crushed the sons of Israel that year. For eighteen years they afflicted all the sons of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in Gilead in the land of the Amorites." And then go through verse nine. The sons of Ammon crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim, which are tribes of that nation. Um, so that Israel, so that Israel was greatly distressed. Well, that that deteriorated, deteriorated pretty quickly, I'd say. So you know, here we are in, Ge in Genesis, and God's saying, "I have all these plans for you." Okay, great, we have a future. And then here we are in Judges, and God's like. You gone done it. Like, I'm taking the land away from you at this point. It's like, whoa, what, what happened between point A and point B? Uh, w was that indeed, was that the end? Maybe, you know, that was then. God had plans for us then, but, but this is now. God's given up on us now. You know, uh, maybe God has finally had enough. And this is just kind of the, the line in the sand. I've, I've crossed it. Um, you know, and before I go any further, I do want to mention that not all problems are from sin. Sometimes in life, you're just going to have to wade through a bunch of crap. And it's not going to be because of sin. It's just going to be because of, well, a lot of different reasons. So before we go any further, that does need to be stated. Not, not everything is because you sinned. Okay. Um, 
But I do want to tell a story. Uh, I got pulled over and uh, coming down from Cloudcroft. Now this, this just blows my mind because two friends of mine got tickets that same week for doing, I mean, petty things. Things that like, it, it, who cares, but they still got tickets and they had to pay them. Uh, so I'm, I'm coming down Cloudcroft. It's a 45, okay, I kid you not, the cars in front of me are going between 25 to 30. Back and forth, 25 to 30. And right when they get to 30, I think they're speeding up now. So I'm able to not ride my brakes the whole. You know when you're going down a mountain, you're like riding the brakes because the person in front of you is going that slow? Like you can't get your car to go any slower. You're popping it down into lower gears and the thing is still trying to launch you into them. So, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'm just fed up with these people because I mean, they have obviously never driven in the mountains before. And they are having, I guess, a panic attack, trying to figure out how to get down. That's fine for them, whatever. I, in the meantime, am very comfortable driving down mountains. And uh, so I'm just, I'm just so incredibly mad by the, by the point that there's finally a passing zone. Finally. So I speed up and I think I'll be able to pass them no hurry. They're going at tops 30 miles per hour. Even if I go just the speed limit at 45, I'll pass them like that. Well, I go to pass them and there's like four or five cars in a row because they're all going slow. They all speed up. And there's a curve coming up. It's a blind curve. I can't see what's there. And the passing zone is ending. So I'm starting to freak out a little bit because I don't know if there's going to be someone over there that I'm going to hit. So I start speeding even more. They start speeding even more. But now they close in the gap and they won't let me over. So it's like, the, I don't know if they were trying to be rude or whatever. I don't know, whatever. But <laughs> I checked the license plates. They were New Mexico drivers, guys. Okay, so I'm all, at this point, I don't even care anymore. I'm, I'm like, I'll even slow down and get behind them. I just got to get out of the left lane. Like, I'm losing time. So, so I finally get, get, get around getting a, mom, a, a momentum on them. And there's a cop sitting right there running radar. And I don't know at this point, but I'm running 76 miles per hour. So I get pull, I pulled over, obviously, duh. But here's the thing, I honestly, I didn't even care at that point. I was so glad to be out of the left lane. Guys, I was starting to freak out. So I, I swear over and I just go, I don't even bother pulling over into the lane. I just go straight from the left lane to the curb. Because I'm like, as soon as I see him, I'm like, yeah, he's stopping me. And I just accepted it. Um, the guy in front of me was speeding just to be dumb. But he just doesn't stop. He's like, Haha, catch me if you can. So he, <laughs> so he keeps going. Uh, so I, I pull over. He, he, he walls up and he says, um, do you know what the speed limit was? And do you know how fast you were going? I said, I have no idea how fast I was going, but I do know what the speed limit was. And he says, yeah, you were going 76. Are you aware that this is a safety corridor? Oh, no. Oh. No. Actually, no, I did not. Can I have your license and registration? Funny story. I don't have insurance in the car. I have insurance. It's not in the car at the moment because they, don't, they didn't send me one. I didn't print it. So there's a whole thing. There's like, okay, uh, do you have any insurance? And I was like, well, there's this one. He's like, this one's from a year ago. I like, I said funny story, right? And so he says, okay, can I have the registration? I said, funny story. Uh, I've been fighting with the DMV. They still haven't given me my registration. I have registration on the car. I swear, it's up to date. They just won't send me the card. I don't know why. And uh, and so he's like, okay. And then so he takes my license and he says, okay. Well, is this your, a valid? Uh, is this your 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 address on on the license um, on your license? And I say, funny story. <laughs> So long story short, I, I know I messed up. It's nobody else's fault. I was the one driving, so it was my fault. And um, I could have slowed down and moved back over. So even if they were, you know, trying to just be giant jerks, which I doubt it. People, when they start panicking while they're driving, they just kind of don't really pay attention to what they're doing. They start freaking out. Um, I was even watching, you know, that's beside, but the, beside the point. Anyways, so he goes, and I'm all talking to Grace, and I said, yep, they're taking my license for this one. I'm losing my license for this. Okay, let's count. Let's do the math here. If it's 45, 55, 65, 75, and I was going 76, that means I was going over 30 miles over the speed limit. They will take your license for going 15 over the speed limit if they're having a bad day. Okay, and I'm in a safety corridor. 
So I really know that I'm, you know, I'm having a bad time. Okay, he comes back to the car. You can't make this stuff up. You just cannot make this up. And he comes back to the car and he says, do you have any idea what the fine would be for that? And I said, a lot. I wasn't fighting with him, I wasn't arguing with him, I didn't give him a bunch of dumb excuses because it was my fault. And I was just bracing for it, I was waiting for him to say, give me your license right now. Like, I was just waiting for it, I was ready to whip it out, like, here, just take it. <laughs> I know, I'll move over, race you'll drive, it's fine. Like, I, I, okay, he says, it would be excess of $300 just for your speeding ticket. He could have also, in case you don't know the law, he could have also given me citations, which I would have had to pay, plus court costs, for not having insurance and registration in the vehicle. Okay, he, walk, he, he says this, I kid you not, this is not a made up story, this is awesome, okay? He just says, I'm just gonna tell you, slow down. No court costs, no fix it tickets with the insurance or registration, no speeding ticket, have you ever had one of those cops that's just looking for something to get you in trouble for? Yeah. Like when you're driving around on New Year's Eve. I mean, they'll pull you over for anything. They're like, okay, any alcohol in the car? I stopped you because uh, you look like a guy or, I don't know, whatever. Is there any alcohol in the car? You know what I mean? Like, there's some times when they're just looking for a reason to pull you over. This guy didn't do me a favor. He bent over backwards to try and do anything possible to make my day better. And the thing is, there was no reason for it either. He gave me completely unwarranted grace. Now, with that story in mind, let's read the, let's read, it. <coughs> excuse me. Let's read a few verses down the same chapter, Judges 10, verse 15. The sons of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you, only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and he could bear the misery of Israel no longer. He couldn't stand it. They deserved it. But he couldn't stand to punish them any longer. Wow. And when we look at this story, we don't really see a whole lot. There's no big thing. They just simply said, God, we need you. And they did away with the, other, with the foreign gods. That's it. They didn't go through some long, you know, perfect prayer. They didn't do all the right things. They just said, God, we messed up. We need you. Do to us whatever. We messed up. We need you. And the real climax of this whole story is that God couldn't stand to punish them anymore. He couldn't stand it. It's like going through over 30 miles per hour in a 45 safety corridor. God, you had me dead to rights. I deserved it. That is the grace we're talking about. And that's the God we're talking about. He doesn't do us a favor. He stalks us and chases us down waiting, waiting to bless us. And when we simply say, God, I messed up. I'm sorry, I need you. He can't stand that. He can't stand it any longer, even though you deserve it. So here we see, they seek after God. Very simple. God couldn't stand to not answer, though they deserved what they got. He still couldn't stand it. Sometimes we get to this place where we think, God, I have messed up too many times. That's it. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised, the grace of God. You'd be real surprised. You probably are right. You did mess up. 
you went over 30 miles per hour over the speed limit in a safety corridor, and you didn't have your insurance on you. But God is just looking to give grace. He's just looking. A few final thoughts. I changed it from in closing. I even have it written down on my piece of paper in closing, and I scribbled it out. You know, I'm past porn now, but I remember the losing battles. Oh, I remember the losing battles. I remember staying up late at night wondering if I would ever get over it. I remember thinking I'll never change. I remember not liking me. And I remember thinking, is this the last time? Is God going to give up on me this time? I remember that, but I remember God's grace even more, and it got me through those times. It's a very simple thing. If you confess your sins to God, he will forgive you. That easy. If you trust and obey him, your life will have purpose. That easy. And if you want more of God and keep wanting more, he'll give you more. And you'll always have struggles, but if you rest in him, you'll have joy past your sorrow and disappointment. If you, he will. Remember that. If you, he will. Give God a chance to change you and to show his power. Give him a chance. Sometimes we think, well, I can't. I'm embarrassed, or I don't think I'll ever change, or I don't, you know, I'm just not a religious person, or I, I just don't have time, or whatever. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. God doesn't meet you in the middle. As soon as you start to turn, trust me on this, he'll overtake you. He'll overtake you. The grace of God is never something that you can exhaust. Believe me on that. In Acts chapter 2, verse 21, and this is, this is really what I want to leave you with. It says this. It shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You're never too far gone. God's grace is always there. Now, next week, Chuck is starting a new, ser a new series on, in, in the evening services um, entitled The Escape Room. Um, also, Pastor has been doing a series um, on Sunday morning. And uh, if you'd like just a little bit more meat, you, you just want to grow a little bit uh, in more things that um, maybe you don't understand, maybe a little bit harder to understand, I encourage you to come on Wednesday nights or we have a young adult group or whatever. And those things are real good for, for just getting a little bit, a little more. Um, on Sunday services, they're usually a little more... Um, I don't want to say uh, basic, but a little bit easier, a little bit slower pace. I guess that's a good way to say it. So I do want to encourage you on that. Um, but we're going to go ahead and close out in prayer. Chuck, if you could, if you could. Uh